my last video has seemingly rather upset the Flat Earth community. Oh dear. They weren't happy because I stated they think the Earth is a flat disk, and apparently that's not the case. Apparently real Flat Earthers, there's an ironic term for you, but real Flat Earthers don't think the Earth is a flat disk at all. Many even accusing me of outright being a liar and making it up to try and prove a point that doesn't actually exist. Except up until at least a, a few weeks ago, when I was still on Facebook, I was part of a Facebook group, a huge Facebook group called the Official Flat Earth Slash Globe Discussion Group. It has tens of thousands of members arguing both sides, those in favour of globe and those in favour of flat earth. And I've debated with many of the flat earthers, except when I was debating with them, I wasn't just saying, you know, well, globe this and globe that. My arguments were more to pick holes in their flat earth theories. And so I would ask them how various aspects of the flat earth theories worked and what the flat earth models were. And they all gave different answers. I've spoken to people who argue that it is a disc with just an ice wall around it. I've spoken to people who argue that beyond the ice wall is just an infinite sheet of ice. I've spoken to people who say that beyond the ice wall are other continents and seas that we're not allowed to go to because only the Freemasons can go there. Most of argue that there is the glass dome above us, but no one can even agree on how that is. Some argue that the dome covers just the bit of earth that we know about around the the ice wall. Others argue that the dome goes over the entirety of multiple continents or over the entirety of an infinite ice sheet. Some even argue that there's more than one glass dome. I've seen people argue that every individual has their own glass dome above them, or there are two domes to try and account for the fact that star trails in the northern hemisphere go the other way to star trails in the south. There are so many different ideas of the Flat Earth concept that it's impossible to say that this is what Flat Earthers believe because Flat Earthers can't actually agree upon what they believe. Because there is no one Flat Earth complete model. They can't stick to one. They end up changing the model to suit whatever particular debate you're trying to have with them because there's no one model that fits all observations. They have to keep tweaking it and changing it to suit different observations, which then means that it doesn't work for other observations. But anyway, many of the Flat Earthers were saying that the content of my last video was just a straw man argument that didn't prove or disprove the Flat Earth, that it was completely irrelevant. Or there were some people who didn't even go that far and were just saying that obviously the Earth is flat and that I'm a clown. So for every single person who I saw post anything like that, I challenged them to explain the moon and the observations that we can all make of the moon and how does that fit within a flat earth. And none of them answered it. Even the motor mouths who were going on and on and on, back and forth with conversations and, and debates, the moment the challenge of the moon came up, all of them shut up. I mean, let's just ignore the fact that we can't go to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro with a telescope and view the Himalayas, even though they are the two tallest points on Earth with nothing obstructing them. Let's ignore the fact that even as far back as World War II, naval gunnery had reached such a, a, a long range of firing that they were actually instructed to account for the Earth's curvature in their firing distances because the distance that a shell travels will vary depending on whether you're shooting on a flat plane or over a curve. Or let's ignore the fact that in 1912, Robert Falcon Scott had left New Zealand and sailed south and wound up at Ross Island before trekking all the way to the South Pole, only to find the flag of a Norwegian expedition, which had already beat it there, despite the fact that they sailed from Deira, near the Canary Islands, and sailed south, and wound up only a few dozen miles further along the Antarctic coast. Let's ignore all of that and everything else for the moment, and just focus on the conundrum of the moon. Ignoring whether flat earth or globe, 
there are five observations that every individual can make about the moon. No, this is not uh, hypotheticals or anything. This is stuff that you can physically go outside yourself anywhere in the world, watch the moon, you will see these same observations. Observation one, the moon is round. Now, I've never actually seen a flat earther try and argue that the moon is flat, to be fair. They all, I think, agree the moon is a ball. I mean, there, there's debates about how big it is, how far away it is, or what it is made of, but I think everyone agrees it's a ball. You can see it's a ball by the shadow casts of it. The fact that throughout the month, throughout the phases, you see that curved shadow around the edge of it, and it's always the shadow is backside to the sun. So observation one, the moon is a sphere. Observation two, at any given time of the year, from anywhere in the world, the moon always appears the same size. Now, the moon does change in size slightly throughout the year as its orbit gets maybe a bit closer or a bit further away. But on any given night, any given string of nights, hello, you view the uh, you view the moon from anywhere on Earth. It always appears the same size. It doesn't matter whether you're up in the north in the UK or Scandinavia, you're on the equator in Mexico, or you're over in Australia. The moon is always the same size all across the world. Observation three is that from any spot on the Earth, you watch the moon through the night, it will always stay the same size from your vantage point. You can see it come up from one horizon, transit all the way across the sky and down below the other horizon, and it stays the same size all the way across. Observation four is that despite it being a sphere, we only ever see the same face. Again, doesn't matter where you are in the world, only ever one side of the moon shows towards the Earth. Observation five, despite the fact that we all only see one face of the moon, the orientation of that face changes depending on where you are viewing it from. More specifically, it changes depending on your latitude on the Earth. Now, that is... That, that, that's not making assumptions about the shape of the Earth or anything there. That is just five observations that we all can make about the Moon, and any model of the Earth has to be able to account and conform with those five observations. So let's try and fit those five observations into a flat Earth model. Observation one, the Moon is round, okay? That can fit. We can have a Moon orbiting around the, around the Earth, and it can be round. That's not a problem. Now, flat earthers say that the moon and the sun are both about three thousand miles away. They don't buy this. To, they don't buy this idea that the moon is three quarters of a million miles away, and that the sun is ninety-three million miles away, and that the sun is four hundred times bigger than the moon. They think they're both about the same size, and they're both about three thousand miles away. So, we now have a spherical ball. 3,000 miles above the equator of the Earth. Except the Earth is, well, we're not entirely sure how wide the flat Earth is. A spherical Earth is just shy of 8,000 miles across, which presumably if you stretch out a flat Earth, assuming they stick with that idea that the equator is 8,000 miles across, that then puts the entire Earth at about 15,000 miles across. Except that then means with the moon above the equator, on any given night, any country on the equator, the moon is 3,000 miles away from them directly up. And yet a country in, say, the northern hemisphere, 3,000 miles away from the equator, seeing that same moon, the distance that they're viewing the moon from is over 4,000 miles which means they're seeing the moon about 40% further away than people on the equator, which means that given relative distance, the moon should actually be close to half the size when viewed from, say, the UK, than it should when viewed from a country on the equator. That doesn't conform. The only way to have no visible variation in the perceived size of the object like that is to have it much further away. 
If you put the moon 250,000 miles away above the equator to a country that is 3,000 miles away from the equator, that distance that it is seeing the moon from now becomes 250,018 miles, which is only a 0.007% increase. Not enough for, actually, for us to perceive that. That observation doesn't work if the moon is only small and 3,000 miles away. It does work if the moon is 250,000 miles away. That then presents a problem, though, at least for flat Earth, because the sun would also have to be the same distance. You couldn't have a sun that's 3,000 miles away and the moon 250,000 miles away because then solar eclipses just don't work. So the, moon, the, the sun would also have to be at least 250,000 miles away which would then mean that the entirety of an, a flat Earth would be lit all at the same time. Observation 3 kind of ties into observation 2 of this, this relevant uh, relative distances. We can view that the moon stays the exact same size throughout the night. It crosses all the way across the sky. It doesn't change. Now, on the flat Earth model, the idea of the flat Earth is that the Earth is staying still and then the Moon is transiting above us. Which means that if we see the Moon on the horizon and it then comes up overhead and down across the other side, it's going from four, five, six thousand miles away up and overhead to only three thousand miles away and then disappearing back off to five or six thousand miles away. So the moon should actually change in size quite drastically. It should start very small, get bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets overhead, and then transit and go smaller and smaller and smaller. But it doesn't do that. It stays the same size, which means that it has to stay the same relevant distance away from the viewer, which means it would have to be traveling in an arc above one vantage point. But it stays the same at every single vantage point. So it would have to be staying at the same distance away from every single vantage point at the exact same time, which again, does not work for a moon that is only 3,000 miles away. Not only that, we have the viewing angle to consider as well. On a flat plane, any object above that plane would always appear to be above that plane, especially one 3,000 miles above that plane. Even if we take a worst case scenario here and say the moon is 3,000 miles above the equator over South America and you're standing on the ice wall on the opposing side of the Earth, basic trigonometry, you can see that the viewing angle for the moon is still 14 degrees above the horizon. So even worst case scenario, if you made it all the way to the edge of the world, the moon at its furthest point from you shouldn't be anywhere near the horizon, much less going below the horizon and then staying below the horizon for half a day before reappearing near you again. Now, some flat earthers have tried to argue that it's the opacity of the atmosphere that causes this illusion, whatever the fucking hell any of that means. If that was the case and there was some fanciful magic going on that would make the atmosphere magnify the moon to the point of doubling its size at the horizons but not overhead, then whenever I see a plane travel from the horizon, fly overhead and disappear off into the distance, it should also remain the same size. It should appear as big to me on the horizons as it does directly overhead. I know, even you can wrap your head around this. But it doesn't, so atmospheric trickery doesn't seem to fit into that either. Unless the atmosphere is very selective of thinking I'm going to magnify the moon today, but I'm not going to magnify a plane. Observation 4. We only see one face of the moon. Again, anywhere in the world we only see one face of the moon. Now, if the moon was 3,000 miles and orbiting the equator, then... When you're viewing it from the Northern Hemisphere, you would see a completely different vantage point than the Southern Hemisphere. You would be looking at opposite sides of the Moon. 
Now, I've seen flat earthers try and argue this away by using the analogy of sticking a picture to the ceiling and looking at it from opposite sides. But these people seem to overlook a small fact that the moon is not a flat picture stuck to the ceiling. It's a three-dimensional object. So if I stick a three-dimensional object to the ceiling, from one side, I'm viewing this side. From this side, I'm seeing a completely different face of it. And observation five basically ties into the previous four observations. We only ever see the one face. The face changes orientation depending on our latitude. Now, it doesn't work on a flat Earth model because it basically ties into the previous four observations. The moon can't be 3,000 miles away and only very small because you wouldn't see different orientations of the same face, you would be seeing completely different faces depending on your latitude. So the moon would have to be 250,000 miles away. But with the moon then orbiting a quarter of a million miles above a flat Earth, it's just circling overhead and we're all on a flat plane, we're all seeing exactly the same thing. The only way that we can see different orientations of the face of the moon that we have no control over is if the person's vantage point is a different orientation, which only works on a globe. So the observations that we can make of the moon don't fit to flat Earth models. You can make it account for some observations, like moving the moon much further away, but then that means that your observations of the moon versus the sun don't fit, so you have to move the sun further away. But then the observations that we make of the sun versus what it is able to light of the Earth at any one time then don't fit. Every time a flat Earther moves the goalposts of the flat Earth model to try and explain one argument, they open up a can of worms of another observation that then doesn't fit. So they have to then move the goalposts again. So basically, there is no one flat Earth model. The flat Earth model is basically fluid, constantly having to change depending on which particular problem they are trying to solve. Which leads us to only one clear conclusion. Either the people who are advocating that the Earth is flat don't actually believe their own bullshit, and they know full well that the Earth can only work as a globe, they just fancy having a giggle. Or B, they do genuinely think that the Earth is flat, in which case, for the sake of society, they probably shouldn't be allowed to operate anything sharper than a spoon. Anyway, that concludes this particular video. As always, if you have anything to add to the debate, feel free to leave it in the comments down below. While you're down there, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.